have a follow-up to that. You know, a lot of a lot of people will take the view or the belief that technology will save the day. Technology will get us out of this mess with energy. For example, fusion reactions. But I'm a former physicist, and I remember some of my professors working on fusion, saying they had a breakthrough, and that was 10, 15 years ago. I haven't seen any breakthroughs. I haven't seen any net gain in energy. What do you think about the advanced technologies like fusion? Uh, well, speaking specifically to fusion, that's been uh, a, a dream that always seems to be a few years in the future, no matter how many years go by. And if you've ever taken a look at, at, at the tokamak reactor, it's an awesome piece of equipment. I just wonder how much of that reactor could be built just using electricity energy alone. If you look at it, I bet there's a lot of petrochemicals in there. There's a lot of oil-based products. A lot of the manufacturing of all that high technology requires uh, oil to be part of that mix as well. So I would be a lot more... Um, uh, let's say, optimistic at this point that we could transition to an electricity-based future. I think that's where we're going to end up. We're going to have to. I mean, if we, if we run this story out long enough, eventually humans are living entirely on what comes down from the sun every day, plus what little amounts of nuclear that, that we, can, we can manage to uh, you know, uh, keep going along in that path. So this would make me feel better. If I could see that we could manufacture even just a solar panel for making photovoltaics, completely from an electricity cycle, meaning we used electricity to make all of the machines and run all of the processes to develop all of the materials to completely manufacture the panels, put them out, install them, including all the food that people ate who had to do the installation. If all of that could be run on an electrical system alone, then I would feel a lot better about this. We see these technologies being inserted, but people have blinders on as to how much of a subsidy uh, normal fossil fuels were as part of that mix. I think it would be great. It'd be a great time to run an experiment in this country and say, let's see if we can completely electrify one entire part of, of any supply chain and just see if that's, a, if, if, you know, if that's at all possible. If it is, then we should really be moving towards electrifying ourselves. That, that would be the, the fuel of the future because there's so many different ways we can manufacture electricity, some of them by conventional sources, some of them by alternative sources. There's a lot of different ways to skin that cat. But fossil fuels themselves, they obviously have a limited lifespan. We're still living on them at this point in time, and it's not slowing down. The world has over 1,200 coal-fired plants on the drawing boards to be installed in the next 15 years. It's going to pretty much double our, our worldwide consumption of coal over the next 15 to 20 years. It's an extraordinary rate of growth in the use of that uh, fuel, and it has all kinds of issues associated with it that, um, you know, frankly, we need to get very serious about today if we wanted to slow that down, let alone reverse that trend. Okay, so this kind of leads into another question I had. Bridge fuel that's from our current energy source, which is oil, petroleum-based, to, let's say, electrical. The bridge fuel seems to be natural gas. Do you see that as a viable bridge fuel? And if so, uh, what will it look like? Yeah, it's possible it could be a bridge fuel. As much uh, natural gas as the United States is producing right now, we are still not 100% self-sufficient in natural gas. We still import a, a pretty decent chunk from Canada. Eventually, we might be able to get through that. Um, but let's be clear, the United States has two sources of natural gas. One we're going to call conventional reserves. These were gas cap domes that sat and identified geological features, typically with oil underneath them. We would drill a straight down into them, and we would draw those out. Those wells have very, very long lifetimes. They, they could, they could uh, produce for decades. And, but eventually, the pressure in those would run out, and they fall off relatively quickly. With the shale gas plays, what we're on is a, a race now where we're drilling as fast as we can in those plays because those wells have a, what's called a hyperbolic decline rate. You drill the well, so big, long, lateral, uh, frac, multi-stage frac, the first month, it might be flowing, and I'm going to call it 100 units. By the end of that first year, it's flowing at about 50 units. By the end of the second year, it's flowing at about 20 units. Just falls off really quick. So in order to maintain that gas output with wells that decline that rapidly, you just have to keep drilling more of them. The replacement rate looks like we have to probably drill and complete, I don't know, four to 5,000 of those wells every year now just to hold uh, production steady. And if we want to increase production, well... We'd have to drill more than that. It, it's not undoable, but it's an, it's an incredible, uh, it's very capital intensive. 
There are a lot of issues in some of the regions where they're doing this. They don't have the water to complete the, you know, to actually run all the fracks they want to do. So there's, you know, there's issues. And, and uh, against that backdrop of saying, okay, if we really want to increase gas production here, we're going to have to drill, drill really hard. We might have to bend a few rules, but we could do it. Then we'd have to say, okay, what are we going to do with this gas? And, you know, to really have it be useful as a bridge fuel, it has to meaningfully make an impact into the transportation network. Right now, natural gas is just a fraction of a percent of it is actually used for transportation. There's a few compressed natural gas vehicles. I think UPS has a small fleet. There's some buses. But frankly, it's, it's, it's really uh, almost negligible from a national standpoint. So if we wanted to get, pick a number, 20% of all our light vehicles and trucks, or we wanted to get 50% on natural gas, to make those sorts of inroads would cost uh, quite a lot of money. We have an entire infrastructure that has to be built out, pipelines, filling stations, we have to retrofit existing vehicles or build all brand new ones that are ready you know, to have a tank uh, and a carburetor system that can handle the, the compressed natural gas. I think we should do it, but boy, uh, it, at this rate, it's going to take decades to get there. If we want it to be a bridge fuel, we would say, hmm, if it looks like you know, the shale revolution is in oil has got maybe a 10 or 20 year lifetime, if we desperately need to have you know, natural gas be the bridge fuel. Within 10 years, that means we probably have to have it making a meaningful inroad into our transportation network, which means uh, we'd have to be a lot more serious about it than we are right now. I mean, you could go down to any dealer you want and ask, how many compressed natural gas cars could I buy? I think there's one on the market at this point. There might be two. Um, they're hard to come by. They're kind of expensive. And then good luck finding a fueling station. You have to live in a pretty pretty uh, uh, good area where they actually would have a place you could fuel. Not impossible, but it's just going to take a, a, a lot to get there. So if it's going to be a bridge fuel, it has to make it into transportation. It's not really made any dents there yet. It's going to take a lot of time and money to get there. We have a class here in energy management, and it really kind of led me to your work. And um, I, I've been calling crude oil lightning in a bottle because it has the highest BTU return of any substance. And so if natural gas isn't the obvious choice, is there any portable liquid transportation fuel besides natural gas that even is a player? Not really. You know, you hear, you'll, you'll read things about, oh, we, uh, they figured out how to make uh, algae into diesel. And that's true, but but here's the process. Anybody who's been involved in manufacturing knows that, that by the time, for the difference between when a, a scientist has made a cup of this stuff on a lab bench to the time you have a full commercial operation running where you're putting out, and I'm going to call a commercial operation for liquid fuels, let's pick a number, at least 50,000 barrels per day out of that, but 100,000 would, would make it equivalent to a small refinery. 300,000 barrels per day would be a, a pretty decent mid to large size refinery. Uh, so the difference between going from lab bench, which is where you went from discovery, to first you have what's called a demonstration plant where you might be built, you know, getting a couple of barrels per day out of it. And then you go to a pilot plant that might be up to 100 to maybe 1,000 barrels per day to full commercialization. Our learning in the alternative fuels business, especially on biofuels, has been that there's about a 50% chance of failure at every one of those steps. You know, the lab process didn't translate. It was just too cumbersome. It didn't scale. Uh, by the time we went, you know, we got the demonstration plant worked out, but we got to get to uh, the pilot plant. Again, something doesn't scale. We can't mix the things appropriately. We can't control some process variable. With those 50% failure rates, the mistake would be to think once you've seen this algae fuel on somebody's beaker on a, on a desk that we are only a few years from this full commercial plant, when there's really a very small probability when you multiply all those 0.5s by each other, that that will actually, you can't, you can't just jump from bench to, to plant. And so when I look at where we really are in the alternative liquid fuel space, we have, we have no commercial plants at this point in time. We don't have any decent sized uh, pilot plants. We've got some demonstration stuff on the books. The largest one being that I know about is um, uh, the, the Navy has actually got themselves an algae to jet fuel program running. It's costing them about $400 a barrel. Uh, but the Navy, when I was uh, at a peak oil conference a number of years back, they, uh, they had a rear admiral stand up and say, listen, we're doing this because we've looked into the oil situation. It looks serious to us. One thing the military cannot do is exist without liquid fuels. So the military is busy you know, building their own algae to uh, diesel or jet fuel uh, plant. 
And when, when he was asked, when this admiral was asked, why, is, why are you doing that? Why isn't the Department of Energy doing that? He just threw his hands up and said, that's a great question. He had no answer for that one. 